Okay, so today in Day to the Old meeting, we have with us Howard Butler. Um, Howard leads a small team of engineers at Hobu, um, and they develop and support open source LiDAR software. Uh, they're the people behind cloud optimized point clouds, uh, COPC, uh, which is what Howard will be talking to us about today. Uh, but they've all been, also been involved in the development of GDAL, GEOS, Map Server, Shapely, Lib Spatial Index, and R-Tree. So accomplished to say the least. Um, with that, I'll hand over to you, Howard, and take it away. Thanks, James. Uh, you forgot the most important one uh, besides all of those, which is PDAL or Poodle, um, which is Point Data Abstraction Library. And uh, you know, it's it's kind of like the analog the the point cloud analog to GDAL. So it's it's focused on data management, um, data processing, uh, but very geospatial, right? So there, there are libraries for doing point cloud data processing of various kinds. You know, most of that tends to be uh, cap scene captures, or maybe you're doing real time stuff with a robot and you're trying to make decisions based on uh, frames that are coming at you, or you're trying to just capture data using a scanner. You might use other softwares that are out there. Uh, Poodle is is a library for once you get that all uh, geo-referenced and uh, you know positioned in space somewhere, and you want to do GIS-like things to it, you would use Poodle to do that. And so Poodle sits kind of underneath a, a bunch of other tools that we've developed. Uh, one's called Entwine, which is a software for organizing really large point clouds into uh, single scenes or single data structures that you can use um, and access, uh, you know, typically over cloud and in, in cloud scenarios. And then uh, kind of our, our newest evolution or, or sort of, I guess it's a, it's attack right a little bit or attack left on is COPC or Copic um, cloud optimized point cloud, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. So, What's some realities of point cloud data management, at least in, in terms of my experience, our experience with them over uh, well, nearly 15 years now, uh, especially for geospatial point cloud. And when we're talking about geospatial point cloud, we're talking most of the time about LIDAR data, but not always. So uh, people who are capturing LIDAR data, or excuse me, capturing point cloud data with, uh, maybe they're flying a drone, commercial drone, uh, hobby drone, go out, capture a bunch of imagery, dump that into something like Open Drone Map or Pix4D and extract out a point cloud that they're using to, to um, characterize the, the, the ground surface that they've captured. Um, you know, there's lots of ways. To, there's also synthetic radar that is starting to become uh, more available to capture a, a kind of point cloud. It's a little bit different than LIDAR and a little bit different than uh, coincident matched imagery point clouds, but they all have their sort of, um, kind of flavor, but the, they have similar sort of data properties. And, and so an, an important uh, one, and this is probably true, many of these are probably true of raster data as well, if you guys have done a lot of geospatial raster data, I'm sure, is they're read, the data are read many more times than they're written, right? So um, the, 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 the idea that you would have, uh, you know, in like a vector, say you're capturing points uh, of, somebody driving down a road or maybe you're capturing uh, areas by for something and you're putting those in a transactional context maybe you're doing post gis or something like that you don't hard you hardly ever do something like that with point cloud data and if you do it's a very very specific sort of um, part or process of a, of a long uh, of a longer process, right? So uh, maybe you're doing data editing and cleaning or maybe you're doing annotation for machine learning but um, those those scenarios are are kind of a small bit of a much larger context. Um, what do you tend to do with the point cloud data when you're reading? It's mostly searching, right? You want to filter through the content and get um, characterization or points about uh, area and that the density that you care about. Um, I've, I've, you know, my sort of pat phrase about point cloud data is it's fluffy. I mean, it's certainly big data, um, but it it's you know, cloud obviously, but it's 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 puffy. Like removing a single point from a point cloud of millions or billions of points doesn't materially change the character of the data. Um, and so this, for, 
pr provides a data processor lots of opportunity to reduce the data and come up with unique and interesting ways to reduce that data to get the information content from it without having to deal with the data volume. Uh, in the ecosystem right now, there are, there are a number of good open formats. Uh, LAS, which is the, an, an ASPRS specification that came out a very long time ago. And then it's compressed variant called LAZ. Provides them kind of are the shape file or the TIFF of, of geospatial LIDAR point clouds. Um, and you'll also see a lot of the other geospatial point cloud content getting stuffed into that container, even though it might not be completely applicable. Um, and But there are closed formats that can do a lot more, have a lot more capability than, the, than those open formats. And part of the challenge that COPIC or COPC is trying to, to address is how can, how can we catch up to that without disrupting this kind of open ecosystem that we have? So, you know, this is a curve I guess society sees everywhere that you know a hockey stick curve. So with this in in this case, what it is is the linear mode lidar pulse rate, and what that is is how fast can you capture a point, a lidar point of data, uh, how frequently, and you know it's it's continuing to accelerate, and this corresponds directly to data um, fidelity and density, right? So the more points that you can um, put on a surface and use to characterize that surface, the more fidelity that you have. But you also have the problem of it's more data, and it's it's not just uh, always incrementally more data; it's exponentially more data. And uh, data structures and data organization need to catch up to that. So you know, I've always kind of joked, uh, you know, everyone's searching for a holy grail, like this ideal point cloud format. Uh, you know, storage efficient, can search however you want. It's super compressed. Maybe it's a convenient single file, um, works for every computing, and oh, it supports transactions. Like this, this thing doesn't exist, right? The tip kadif doesn't exist. It doesn't exist for raster. It doesn't exist for vector point cloud or vector data either. Um, these, these don't exist. So you know, like always, let's make another one. But um, if if we go and evaluate what's kind of missing in the open uh, formats for geospatial point clouds um, and we kind of do the the matrix of um, capabilities you know the, the really the two biggest missing pieces are uh, allow applications to um, access content spatially instead of sequentially and allow applications to filter data by resolution and so many of the proprietary formats that you'll see out there uh, have this capability built into them whether it's in support of convenient visualization or if it's in support of certain kinds of processing applications. So if we rip out um, two of the harder um, requirements, um, can we can we get an application or a, a, a format that supports you know read oriented applications that we can use over the network and it, it's convenient like it's a single file um, and you know Thanks to Martin Eisenberg, uh, who developed LAZ, which is the, LAZ is the format, LAZIP is the software that implemented it. Um, he developed this, um, he was actually working on uh, mesh compression technology in the 19, late 1990s and mid 2000s. And he was looking for data big enough to, to show that his compression technology mattered, right? At the time, like people were still compressing uh, Bunny. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to show how awesome your compression technology is when, you know, you'll have 100,000 points. And so he start, went out and started looking for, you know, things with millions or billions of points and quickly found out that, well, hey, there's this LIDAR stuff. And, uh, you know, applying these technologies to LIDAR data uh, shows lots of utility and promise. Uh, he recently died uh, September of last year, but he has a, you know, a large open source and open legacy with uh, his open source LAS tools. So if, if we were to take LAZ kind of at its current position in the ecosystem, you know, where it sits right now is it has pretty much industry-wide support. I mean, there's a big software vendor in Southern California, just GIS software vendor in Southern California that doesn't uh, support it, but kind of the rest of the industry does. And, and 
both in geospatial industry and in the LIDAR and the BIM industry. They'll, they at least provide interop for LAZ. Uh, LAZ provides an efficient, storage efficient lossless compression. Uh, like its focus and its model is really focused, is oriented towards how to make it, you know, as compact as possible. Um, we recently adjusted the software license of the LASZIP code and um, subsequent forks. Uh, there's, we have one called LASPERF uh, to be Apache public license. So in the past, uh, LASZIP was LGPL. You know, that was an impediment for a few folks, not really. Um, but the one place it was an impediment for was people doing uh, static deployments and things like iOS and Google Play Store. And so, you know, this was, this was relaxed to, to fix that. Uh, there's JavaScript, C++, and Python implementations for it. Um, so, you know, there, you have free open source implementation for LAZ basically everywhere. You don't have to worry about it too much. Downsides for LAZ, though, is it's really kind of CPU intensive. I mean, it's all about extract, uh, compressing and squishing as much fluff out of the data as possible. I mean, the model is quite complex. And um, as a software uh, concern like you have to spend a lot of time studying it to understand um, how it applies arithmetic encoding to uh, linear mode lidar and and the, that's one point that's kind of important is laz was developed for what's called linear mode pulsed lidar where um, you know it's like a laser range finder we, we send a pulse out we measure how how long it took for that um, uh, return to come back and we do that as frequently as possible. There are other point clouds that are captured that don't do that and don't model that way. And LAZ doesn't always fit them as well. So, um, you know, the Sullivan quote, like form follows function and formats are compromised. This is always going to be true. Um, but LAZ has a kind of a unique sort of space in the ecosystem as kind of the compressed TIFF or the, or, or the content encoding for a TIFF. So if you've done like LZW for a TIFF or something like that, LAZ is, is analogous to that in, in Point Cloud. So it, it provides promise as, as a way for us to augment or enhance it um, because there's already so much of it out there. You know, there's petabytes of public LAZ content out there. Um, it's been around for 10 plus years. It's widely implemented. There's implementations everywhere. And, and really, we're following suit with COG, right, or Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF, which is let's take an existing format um, and enhance it in an opt-in way that provides us the capability we need, um, but doesn't disrupt applications that simply want to read the content. So if we focus in on LAZ, of course, uh, the, the two capabilities that we really are interested in and augmenting LAZ for is how can we do spatial access and how can we provide resolution uh, independent selection of the content? And, you know, for, for spatial access, this means selecting for a, a window, whether it's a 2D or a 3D window without doing extra computing, right? Without having to read extra data or within reason or without having to decompress extra data. And, and the same thing for resolution, right? So be able to, um, filter and select data to some specified resolution um, without taking on extra computing overhead. I mean, these are really important capabilities. This is the kind of the thing that Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF, of course, provides, right? So, um, you know, with, with its overviews and how those overviews are organized, we're trying to do the same thing with, with LAZ. And the reason for this is, uh, you know, the great innovation in cloud native geospatial, which isn't really that much of an innovation, but it, it is being able to access for, uh, you know, range read, partial access uh, over HTTP. Um, you know, the cloud object stores all provide this as part of their interfaces. And what it allows is applications can control, given some metadata, to tell them kind of a map of how the files laid out and where they can find everything. Applications can control their traversal and their par parallelism across that data, right? So they can choose to just read it all in one big bite, uh, or they can skip and hop across it given uh, the map um, that they were um, provided. So for LAZ, uh, Copic or Cloud Optimized Point Cloud, um, add some optional metadata 
um, and, and this metadata is really a, a sorting or an oct tree that describes uh, how those points are related to each other. Um, it follows the same thing as something called entwined point tile. Entwined point tile was like an exploded, um, uh, non-condensed version of, of, uh, of the data structure in LAZ. We're providing that as a single condensed uh, data structure. And then it stores those oct tree nodes uh, clustered according uh, to, to how that tree is shaped. And so this was a feature that existed in LAZ uh, that wasn't widely used. Um, you know, in, in the bottom uh, little figure there, you can see those gray boxes. So, you know, they're all different sizes if the if the octree nodes are kind of variable. Uh, a normal LAZ file has all of those little gray boxes be the same width, right? 50,000 points is kind of a, a, a normal default setting. Um, and no one was really using the variable capability of, of LAZ to, to support this, um, but by organizing and clustering that data structure, or cl clustering that content according to that data structure, older applications can continue to read the content without being disrupted. And applications that understand cloud optimized point cloud can use the metadata, which is the blue, the blue box, the, the, the oct tree to help them navigate that gray box and, and skip and hop around given what they know about the shape of that tree and, and what they're looking for, whether it's for resolution or for uh, a spatial window. So what? So what can you do with this? Um, why, why would you bother? Why do you care? So the first thing, uh, you know, that, you know, we've been focused on for quite a while is rendering data in point cloud, or excuse me, rendering point clouds in web browsers. Uh, the, the biggest reason for that is context, right? What is this data? What does it look like? Um, you know, essentially, basically imagery, pre image preview, right? So uh, this is an example application we developed uh, it's, it's the renderer is cesium, but the, the data back end here is a cloud optimized point cloud. And, you know, this is the kind of capability that uh, you can provide a renderer. Um, the, the only kind of the interesting back end that's going on here is the, the cesium sort of 3D tiles format is kind of converted into copic range requests uh, on the fly. Um, and that's happening in your browser. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, the nice thing about that is, uh, this cloud optimized point cloud or uh, copsy file, right? I can hand this to a data provider. I can hand it to an archive. I can hand it to a geospatial processor who might be using open source tooling and they can use it for data processing in addition to this rendering, right? So it's not just a, a purely rendering friendly, rendering oriented um, format. So what? Um, Here's a little more details about this viewer. Um, it also renders entwine EPT um, entwine point tile if you have that as well. Um, not open source at the moment. Um, so what? What else can you do with this? Why? Why would you care about cloud optimized point cloud? Um, the ability to access content in in a resolution in uh, select with resolution selectivity means you can do things like um, filter the data provide a preview image or provide some sort of um, characterization without touching all of the content. Um, you know, this particular file that I was showing in the viewer is like 360 million points. I don't know, it's like, I don't know how big it is. Maybe it's 120 megabytes compressed or something like that. Um, but I don't need to read all of those points to make a two meter intensity sort of image here, right? And so um, I can I can select, you know, I've, a tiny percentage of that, what less than one percent of that, in a second over HTTP, a couple seconds over HTTP, and provide this kind of overview capability. I can also, as depending on how my applications are oriented, I can uh, make them touch this content in parallel, however I want. I don't have to worry about um, things, you know, a server being conflicted or resource limited or anything like that. Um, and and so applications kind of are able to control how they man, uh, maneuver and filter the data. Um, so what? So what else can you do with cloud optimized point cloud? Uh, so the QGIS release that's 3.2.6 that's coming out this week, I believe, um, has uh, Copic rendering support um, directly in it as part of its new 3D uh, capabilities. So in the past QGIS release, we had done uh, something called a point cloud crowd crowdfunding effort to provide point cloud rendering capabilities to QGIS. 
And that was based on entwine point tile. Um, our experience with that is kind of what informed uh, our development of Copic, right? So entwine point tile is, is all of those nodes that um, we were showing or I was showing in that picture essentially stored as individual files, right? So if you were doing uh, raster tiling in like 2006 or eight, um, you would have had these, you know, big object collections of stuff that you might have stored uh, as you rendered out a full tile set or something like that. And so EPT is very much like that. Um, the problem with that is it's really great in a cloud object store because you never have to move the data, although it has some downsides. One is you have millions, potentially have millions of things. The other is you um, might pay per object access cost. and so providing a condensed storage, uh, especially for local file systems, um, means that the data are easier to move around and federate, which is important for like desktop scale type stuff. And also um, you still get this uh, uh, cloud capability with the, with the content. Uh, so what? So what else can you do with Copic? Um, we recently worked with Microsoft Planetary Computer to process all of the USGS 3 depth uh, point cloud content into Copic. And so that's available via stack, uh, the, the planetary computer stack API. And um, you can use their stack API to, to, you know, to select for, to select for a window and go, hey, which tiles are here? What's in those tiles? And then, you know, do whatever processing that you want to the content. So I have a notebook up at this, up at this location that kind of demonstrates how to use Poodle to do this, where um, you touch the Stack API, you go figure out, hey, which tiles do I have available? Go read them with Poodle. And in this case, we were trying to figure out uh, what are the building heights around this, uh, this the Millennium statue in, in downtown Chicago. The other thing with Copic, of course, is, and I, in my opinion, the most important story about Copic is the backward compatibility, right? So it, it's an opt-in thing, right? You don't have to um, try to bootstrap implementations from everybody else. Um, you know, even though we're open source, even though we can give away as much data as possible, like getting so commercial software applications and other open source software applications to provide direct support for that thing requires time and effort on their part. They already have LAZ support in many cases. And so being able to augment LAZ with the, with the Copic metadata means that applications that can use it can do so, but at, not everyone needs to or must do it to be able to get access to the content. I mean, I think that was the, the most important hook about cloud optimized GeoTIFF. Um, which was people can continue to access the content normally if they if that's how they understand it. Applications can do that, and that that backward compatibility is what allowed uh, or is continuing to allow kind of the the big step forward with how people attack and manage this data this kind of data in the cloud. Uh, kind of a few final points here. So. Um, you know, maybe you've worked with ex what I would call exploded uh, data structures like ZAR or TileDB in relation to something like Copic or Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. Um, you know, the, the exploded storage scenario actually works really well if you're in a cloud object store and you never have to move content. Additionally, if you have applications that are purpose built for it, like maybe you're using some open source library that provides support for it and you don't have to think about it. It's really nice to not have to worry about uh, tiles and resources and, 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 and so on. So if you're familiar with Stack, um, the distinction I make is it's, it's nice to treat everything as one large collection and you don't have to worry about all the individual items in it, especially if they're all essentially the same content. Um, but for point cloud data, of course, with raster data as well, tile, that, that concept of tile or how the data were cut up into pieces to facilitate convenient transfer, management, federation, that's the dominant organizing principle of this kind of content. And um, it's also the origination or, or the, 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 the primary key back to all of its metadata. And so 
for data structures and data organizations that disrupt that or or smooth it together or filter it out and fuzz it out, um, it, it makes it very difficult uh, for for applications to be able to maybe they need to go back and do that lineage and, and archaeology for like metadata purposes or um, maybe they need to recreate something because um, you know they're, they're, they want to track down why or something changed or how some data um, was manipulated and the kind of smooshing everything together can make that challenging and then finally with the EPT our experience has been like even though it's useful, it's convenient, uh, we provided tons and tons of data available online for people to do stuff with, like bootstrapping industry support for something like that is very, very difficult, especially if it's kind of special, if it's kind of special. And, and in EPT's case, it was, you know, a, a specific content encoding for very large point clouds um, and works really great for that, but um, it, it still still wasn't enough. So the, the roadmap for cloud optimized point cloud here, you know, we finalized the specification last November. Um, Poodle uh, 2.4, which was released a couple months ago, has both a reader and a writer support. Um, Poodle's implementation of Copic is a pure memory implementation, right? So if you need to make really big Copic files, you need something that behaves a little differently. And so we have a software library called Untwine. Uh, which allows you to do that in exchange for not loading everything in memory though it loads everything on into a really big disk cache right it essentially explodes everything out onto disk uncompressed sorts all of the data and then merges it all back together uh, there's a python library out there called copiclib that uh, provides some read and write capability although it's not uh, maybe as convenient as uh, that capability from within poodle um, you know it has some special capability of course, the JavaScript implementation you saw in the, the movie I was showing uh, is also available, provides, you know, read support over JavaScript. You just, again, is getting released this week and, uh, you know, OS 10, Mac and Windows, you should be able to plop in a, a, a Copic file or actually any Poodle readable file and it'll turn it into Copic. And also you can point to an HTTP, HTTP readable Copic resource and it, it'll stream it in via that. Um, Poetry 1 and Poetry 2 um, supports on the queue, but it hasn't been implemented, at least in public that I've seen. I've seen a couple of private implementations. FME, I, the rumor is FME's uh, summer release will have support for it. Haven't seen it yet. Uh, we got a pull request uh, for LASPI to provide Copic read support and over HTTP as well. So. Um, if you're in pure Python, you can you can do at least the read side of Copic, and then you know these these few other uh, software libraries are out there. Uh, so kind of take homes from my uh, this particular deck, you know, hey, Copic is it's an extension of LAZ, opt-in extension, um, backward compatible. That's the really important part. Uh, Martin Eisenberg, uh, his estate worked with us to relicense the LAS zip code base, not LAS tools, but LAS zip to Apache public license, um, which is going to allow um, people doing embedded applications of this software to, to put it wherever they need. Poodle has op good open source support, other open source tools, you know, coming online. Commercial uh, support, hey, go ask your vendor. Um, you know, they aren't going to implement stuff until there's demand for it. So um, you know, hopefully we'll start to see more demand as, as people um, build up their use of it. And, and, you know, like all of the things, we don't really have an official pronunciation. So um, as long as everyone knows what they're talking about together, I guess it doesn't matter. So that's about all I have for uh, prepared content. You know, happy to take uh, topic questions and or generic point cloud collections or just like old software developer guy questions like if you wanted to chat about other open source projects i'm happy to go through any of that kind of stuff as well um you know it's your guys this time and um you know thanks for the opportunity yeah thank you that was great very uh insightful and uh very dense i'm going to be picking through this presentation afterwards i think um yes i'll open the floor for questions for howard john go for it straight in there 
Um, well, first of all, you, you answered my first question right at the very end there, um, with no official pronunciation. Though you keep calling it Copic, so that's what I'm going to call it from now on. It's less of a mouthful than COPC, which is uh, um, <clears throat> really uh, going back to a slide or two where you're looking about sort of future support for um, you know in, in other software and stuff. So I use Cloud Compare quite a lot, and obviously that can read in LAZ, LAZ files, but um, do you know if there's going to be any support there for, you know, uh, keeping it in Copic sort of form to does its own, uh, option yeah. Reading? So I, you know, I've talked to, I've talked to the, the, the Danielle, the developer, kind of the lead developer, and he's very interested in Copic. Um, but, and, and the, the Octree is basically the same as, as what cloud compare does but he doesn't have the hooks to his renderer to allow the indirection to go between his kind of data structure and the data structure that would, that Copic would provide yet. So it's not like easy plumbing. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I don't, I, I think he's kind of waiting to see, well, is this actually going to take off and get used by folks? Um, I, I, my opinion is Q just jumping on board with it probably pushes stuff in that direction pretty quick just because people are going to be using Q just to make what I would call desktop scale Copic files uh, quite conveniently because the, the thing Q just provides really well is all the rest of the GIS stuff, right? Like people want, people want their Q point clouds and they're special and quirky and neat, but they want that stuff in GIS context and Q just provides that. Uh, and the current implementation in 326 is really nice. I mean, you can do synced views, you can do fly throughs, but you can also like, hey, I want to render some chunk of this onto a map and print it out somewhere. And and so, um, you know, I think that's a really important sort of kind of keystone implementation uh, of Copic. I mean, Poodle, of course, can be a keystone implementation, but like, hey, you, I mean, it's just a command line utility for doing data management. It's not. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's saved my life many times, um, Google. But I guess, yeah, I mean, I've used the night list, the hugest night list to uh, look at the, some of the copy point clouds. And you're right, and in it, because one of the questions I've, I've been asked in the past is, what's the point of a point cloud? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it is a sort of almost an intermediate format to generating TIFFs or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, seeing it actually combined with, with GIS. Really good. And so the la next question, sorry to hog all the questions, but um, is, so I've worked a lot with Cesium in the past and in, in, in a previous life. Um, so I wrote my own client for Cesium for rendering points. What it, <laughs> without, without wanting to, uh, I'm a big fan of Patrick, so without, you know, obviously uh, saying anything negative about him, but what's your thoughts on Cesium's point cloud information scene? Originally used their own sort of ETS format, and now Cesium Next they're going to um, uh, 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 GLTF for everything. And I just think that seems like a slightly weird sort of step on their part. <laughs> um, well, I understand the desire to like be able to shovel data to the renderer or to the to the hardware without having to do anything to it. Right, that's how you get performance. Um, for, for the viz side you know with EPT our experience with EPT was similar to cesium in that you had this exploded object store thing right and so applications can figure out what they want to select and go read it and do whatever they need with it our challenge with EPT and I think it's the challenge with cesium and, and i3s too, both of their point cloud formats is is this exploded thing not so much how the encoding itself but the, if you need to federate data, like so the, the, the pipeline of how data moves from like a person with a scanner to somebody's desktop where they do a bunch of desktop processing and then they do a bunch of kind of finalization and, and kind of put a project together and then they deliver that content uploaded or they ship a drive somewhere. That, that whole kind of lineage process, the earlier that your format and your tools can be in that thing, the just the, the lot more sort of reach and leverage that mm. the things will have, right? And so the exploded format stuff, because of how it's organized and because of the cost of having 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of objects or whatever, each, each, each kind of step in that process has a federation action, right? Like you need to move data somewhere from here to there and push it up to the cloud, or you need to do something with it. And those exploded object sto storage approaches make that very, very difficult. And so our experience with EPT was we were never going to get close to the data origination with EPT um, and because of uh, because of the exploded thing, and and LAZ is kind of at the exhaust end of the processing, but it's but it's close enough because it's the archive, right? Like people use LAZ as the, the archive and transmission format. And so my kind of take on it was, well, if I need to put 200 terabytes of content in a cloud store somewhere because it's the archive of Western Europe or the United States, how do I organize that data so it's the most useful to the most clients? Mm -hmm. And you, today in 2022, that's LAZ content. And so augmenting that with with the data structure, uh, with the Octree structure, the cost of that is about 20 to 30 percent less storage efficiency because of the way L of LAZ works in in a sequential mode. But applications don't have to change. And so with with I3S and 3D tiles, like you have to, you're asking that application to provide direct support for this thing. Mm -hmm. And that means they have to go through to their software tools and, and wire it in. And then, you know, they change the format with 3D Next, right? So it's like, okay, we get to do it again. And and the one nice thing and convenient thing about 3D Tiles Next is for 3D Tiles Next, the way the implicit, implicit um, data structure thing can work, it should be possible to uh, directly re, uh, uh, provide a name direction into something like a Copic file with that. But you're, at, at, at the wire level, you're still going to have to read that LAZ content and put it in the format that, that 3D tiles can consume, mm -hmm. or th excuse me, 3D tiles clients can consume. But you could probably do that on the, uh, as part of the read process, essentially what we were doing in our, in our web client. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is kind of also the challenge for Czar and uh, in Rasterland, right? Like um, the 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 Czar family of stuff is really cool, uh, you know, doing um, pandas and and Dask and everything against all of this stuff is really super convenient, and people are building awesome things with it. Um, for for geospatial though, like that that data origination story is still a big part of of the process and um for better or worse it's tiles yeah. well, thank you um just one very very last thing sorry to hog it I'll hog all the time uh small feature request on the copic viewer can you add a switch to enable um depth testing on the point cloud so i was having problems around point cloud was below the ground but still rendering appearing on top of the ground and then it swims around in a oh oh um, to toggle that uh yeah sure <laughs> um, i'm not the person i'm not the person to do that I, I mean so that viewer is not currently open source no, that's, um exactly that's, that's what i'm asking you <laughs> yeah we know it's getting used a lot though we can see the traffic on it and it's getting yeah. used quite a bit because it's super convenient yeah. um and you know our sort of strategy with it is if you know somebody wants to embed it into specific applications you know to contact us um but uh yeah we can we can we can definitely uh add a couple of future lets if you have a few others you know feel free to send a note okay um, yeah yeah i'm non-paying customer so <laughs> feel free to put them on the bottom of the list as an open source proprietary, I have a lot of those so <laughs> sometimes they're worth listening to though even for even for feature requests Thank you. Cool. Thanks, John. Uh, Jesse. Hey, Howard. Thanks for the presentation. That was very interesting. Um, I was kind of wondering, like, I, I would imagine COGS provided some level of inspiration or reference for, for developing uh, Copic. And I, I was kind of wondering, like, from that, like, what, what did you take from COGS that you sort of took as inspiration that you really did apply within uh, Copic versus stuff that you maybe said, no, we this is actually an area where we need to go in a different direction. 
from uh, what they did with with cogs um so tiff in general is just way more complex than than laz i mean laz's encoder is super complex but that like an laz file is is really just an las header with with encoded bytes tiff can be like it's a container you have overviews you have like each one of those overviews can be encoded independently um you know there's all this metadata that sits there that's uh context specific that allows you to how you do processing so in in so you know laz is a lot simpler than than tiff so that helps a lot uh the the, the big inspiration you know we we had always kind of talked about pardon me what's the ultimate point cloud format right like if you were to like you know you you could have the industry do whatever you wanted and um they would always implement it and what what would be that format that would provide that capability for you and of course every one of the 14 standards is, does that but um and you know the, the ability to range read is is really important and but you can get that in lots of ways i mean just a bunch of objects is essentially that but the but the ability for an application to consume the content, those bytes, independently of its organization, if they choose to, that's the, for me, that's the key thing about COG that uh, was really important in allowing software to bootstrap their support for it incrementally instead of just in a, in a discontinuous way. I don't know if that's a word, but like, there's not this hard break. Like I have to support explicitly all of this stuff of this format to be able to read the bytes. And, and that's the, I think that was the thing that, uh, cloud optimized geotiff because there's many other, uh, streamable raster containers out there. Right. Like, you know, there's the MRF stuff there, there was, uh, what well, you can do tile DB stuff. Like there's lots of different capabilities now that czar too like there's tons of things that do that it's it's the if i want to take that tip file and put it all the way back in arcgis 8 point ever i i can do that with a tiff file and i can't do that with any of those newer things and so oops sorry and so that 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 sort of ramp instead of a cliff like is is the thing that for me that was most inspiring about cloud optimized geotiff but we were kind of fumbling around in in point cloud land like well how would we actually do that um it wasn't until um you know of course the the pandemic happened and nobody everybody's on zooms like this and it's really hard to have a a discussion about um, you can't just it's difficult to just noodle on stuff right so we i had my developers you know there was kind of the first uh sort of pause in the in the pandemic like last summer and i'm like hey let's get together and 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 hang out and so we we got to actually be in person you know and after two hours of like just going well what ultimate point cloud format that was always our kind of joke it's like well could we do this in laz and then we're like you know everybody like takes a sip of their beer and 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 I go, well, there is this like variable encoding thing that could maybe work, you know, like it, it was just like having people in the room and being able to to just hash on it was an important part of it. And, you know, in retrospect, it was kind of obvious, but like most of those things aren't right. Um, and so then even after doing that, it was like, okay, does this actually work? Like do, 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 past applications that are six years old that can read laz content can they read these variably encoded files without any issue like if you can't do that it's dead right so we did a bunch of homework to go figure all that stuff out and you know once it was very clear we could do it you know martin was actually still alive at the time i had talked to martin about it and you know but he wasn't kind of in shape to to really push on it so um anyway yeah cog was definitely inspiration it was the combination of cog and our experience with ebt or an exploded object store right which is you know for our users and and folks that we work with like cloud is really important right but it's not just cloud they need to federate data up and down from the cloud and container suitcase whatever your phrase is that's an important part of that story and so having both of those features was really important 
very windy. You can you can interrupt me. So. <laughs> oh, great. Got plenty of time. Uh, I have a question. Um, cloud optimized vector. What are your thoughts on front runners there? Uh, so I'm not in the vector space a whole lot. Uh, uh, I mean, we don't work. I, I guess point clouds are a kind of a really specialized kind of vector, but um, you know the the GeoParquet stuff is very interesting. Um, you know, we had done an arrow implementation for Poodle a long time ago, and we actually backed away from it. Um, the reason being, at the time, uh, arrow kind of required continuous memory allocations, right? And it was a continuous data structure. And Poodle can't work that way because people are making such big things, like it needs to be able to allocate stuff in chunks and and otherwise you just fragment the hell out of everything. And so, you know, that was like three years ago, we had kind of played around with Arrow. And and so I, you know, I'd done some work there and and was, you know, quite familiar with it. And and so, you know, to see see the parquet stuff kind of start to take hold is really interesting whether that's actually cloud optimized you know i don't know i mean the if the kind of the principles of cloud native geospatial are, are are at least as we talked about in that uh, online conference of last month or a couple months ago is like you know read oriented is a big one and then you know range readable um you know column oriented data stores maybe um you know that range readable stuff is maybe more of a challenge here. It certainly could be a lot more chat chatty to 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 access content that way. Um, but it's certainly an interesting approach. Uh, you know, Paul Ramsey was just doing shape files as cloud cloud organized stuff, which is kind of fun. Um, which you know would be disheartening to that we still have to live with shape files. <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe that's the that's where we're going to end up. Who knows? Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not tracking that stuff as close and close enough to like have a strong opinion. Um, but uh, you know, for Geoparquet, Geoparquet, I think my only input there was like, hey, don't use well-known text as the coordinate system description. So um, I'm glad that got changed. Yeah, me too. Um, cool. Thanks. Anyway, um, anyone else with questions? I have more, but I'll give other people chances. All right, so now I get to ask you guys questions. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, are you guys all in on um, GitHub Actions and and CI and and using kind of GitHub Actions as like a I don't know a workflow engine for how your distributed company operates what what do you how do you guys deal with like managing development of all of this complex stuff uh yeah it's a good question i don't know if i'm best place to answer it um i'm a data scientist so i don't tend to get too involved with the guts of github um if anyone else wants to jump in uh go for it my experience at least as part you is that we do use github actions quite a lot and it seems to be something that we're exploring more of and trying to integrate it more into how we work. Um, yeah, that's all I can really say on it. <laughs> um, but I can pass your question on to uh, the rest of the organization, uh, for sure. Um, some of them have dropped off for other meetings who would be better placed to answer that, I think. And then uh, the other question I would have is like, Given all these open source tools, you know, you guys are certainly users and have been supporters of open source stuff like GDAL and Proj and all this stuff. What is your, what is the developer relationship of, of you guys to those tools? Like, is it purely user oriented or, or do you like take them and like add your own tweaks to them and maintain that in house? Again, I'm not probably the best person place to answer this. So if anyone in the audience here wants to jump in, you can just cut me off at any point. Uh, my my experience with it at Spy Geo is that we do tend to use things off the shelf a lot because we're a consultancy company. And so the we're not tending to build long-term 
um, product focused uh, things. Um, so we use a lot of stuff off the shelf and then we tweak it as needed. Um, so for instance, for like things like stack uh, fast API, we'll like write our own extensions as needed. Um, um, that's some of the things I've been involved in. Uh, and I'm sure we do the same for, for some other um, more geospatial focused uh, open source pieces too. Um, don't know if that answers your question. Jesse, go for it. Yeah, I, I suppose maybe to add to that, like with, we are using, uh, doing some fast stack API development for one of our clients. And as part of that, well, actually, I think we have two clients that are kind of both doing some fast stack API development. And, and, and so as part of that development, we'll talk with them about how we can contribute back uh, to those sources. Obviously, sometimes with clients, that doesn't really work for them uh, for their own you know, business reasons. But it's, I think it's something that we, we try and encourage where we can with our clients. Um, and then I, I think a lot of our, our team just kind of likes to contribute on their own on the side as, uh, as they work with this stuff too. So it's I suppose maybe a little bit more ad hoc in that sense. And then a, a final question. Uh, do you see point clouds? Are you, are you getting customer contact for point cloud stuff? And is it increasing? I mean, is this Copsy, Copic stuff interesting to you guys as just technical? Or is it like, oh, we might actually be putting this into practice somewhere? Definitely of interest generally. Uh, we've got a few people who are pretty active in the point cloud space. Um, Darren, who's not on this call at the moment, um, is one in particular. Um, Jesse, have you seen any more business side of things? Um, no, not directly. And I, I guess I tend to think the reason for that might be that I think where point clouds fit in the value chain is a little bit upstream from us, where we're working with, you know, some of our clients. I think they're at that point they're already looking at. Uh, you know, a TIFF or a roster DEMs. That that extraction has already been done, and they're not they're not going back to that original data source. I, I think I I sort of tend to think that point clouds are something that the surveyors and those geo GIS people play with, and then it gets handed off as something else. And I tend to think that might be why for some of the clients that we're dealing with, we don't see them using point cloud data directly they're probably using derivative products and and hence we would be dealing with those derivatives anything else Howard? no i don't think so appreciate the time hopefully you got something out of it it's neat that you guys uh do this every month yeah for sure we'd love to have you back one day no doubt it's been really really useful for a lot of us uh basically the same talk will be at phosphor g uh in florence uh, end of August, so if, uh, hopefully I'll see a few of you there. Yeah, and, you will. Definitely. And uh, we'll also be uh, arguing about a lot of other junk, I'm sure. <laughs> no doubt. Over a beer that time, I hope. I think a few of us are going. Not myself, but a few others. So, yeah, they'll see you there, I'm sure. Cool. Well, with that, we can wrap up. Say thanks again, Howard. It's been it's been great. Um, and uh, all the best. See you, see you around. Thanks, Howard. Bye-bye now. See ya. Thank, Thank you. you.